Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is that too loud this time, Hope? Nope, sounds good. <laughs> okay. So and, and that's remind us of who you have behind you because we can see him beautifully right now. You have a rescued fish. That's really good timing that we were just talking about fishes and aquatic animals. So this is Bosco. He's rescued and he's got this nice new 150 gallon tank thanks to the Micro Sanctuary Resource Center. Um, a grant from them. So yeah, and actually I just noticed it was the first time he'd ever gone in his cave. So maybe he's calm and enjoying this talk. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe not the subject matter. So um, just to briefly share that I'm so happy to be a Humane Hoax team volunteer. I'm a co-founder and board member with the Piedmont Area Vegan Educators in North Carolina. Um, and I'm so happy to introduce our final speaker, Fireweed. She is also on the Humane Hoax team. She's joining us from British Columbia, Canada. And I've been a long distance friend and admirer of Fireweed for probably a decade. Fireweed identifies as an eco-feminist artist, grassroots activist and organizer committed to collective liberation. She is a speaker, published author, former newspaper columnist, and pirate radio show co-host. Thanks to a nomination by her peers, dedication to local food security and the veganic agriculture movement, Fireweed has been recognized by Oxfam International as a local food hero. She sees the shadow side of the contemporary locavore movement as regressively complicit in propping up the humane myth or the humane hoax. And we'll be sharing some of her thoughts about that with us today in locavorism and the humane hoax and ecofeminist perspective. Welcome, Fireweed. Thank you so much. Sina, I'm just checking to see now if my screen is, is shared. All right, so thank you for the introduction again, Sina. It's an honor to be participating in this way and in such wonderful and inspiring company today. As a grassroots activist, I embrace veganism as an integral part of my work for pro-intersectional social justice. I've been vegan for over 35 years now, most of it striving to live eco-consciously in a rural community. So what I'm going to share here today as I link locavorism and the humane myth will be mostly a reflection of my own lived experience in farm country. So primarily personal thoughts and observations, including a few select memories to help illustrate my own vegan journey over time. But just to add a little color to this presentation, I'm also going to stream some local wildlife images courtesy of the very talented photographer, Jerry Ambery, who just so happens to also be vegan and together with my dear friend, Cheryl, operates Island Pacifica Animal Sanctuary here on Denman Island. To begin, however, a land acknowledgement. I identify as a settler living on First Nations territory and am dedicated to truth and reconciliation with First Nations peoples. A land acknowledgement is part of putting that commitment into practice. This small body of land where I've made my home and I'm speaking from today can be located on any contemporary map off the west coast of Canada. But Demet Island is actually situated on the unceded territory of the Comox First Nation and on shared territories of the Kwakwakiwakwa and other Coast Salish peoples who have inhabited this region for thousands of years. Now, my ancestry is primarily of European descent, so I recognize that the privilege I have of living where I do connects me not only to the colonial past, but to the legacy of colonization as it continues to unfold today. And I recognize that with this privilege comes the responsibility to live in right relationship, not only with indigenous peoples, but with the other than human beings who also live here and have evolved here over millennia. Gaila Kasla, thank you. Now, to be humane is to be kind, compassionate, and to show mercy, if we accept the, the, uh, the dictionary definition, of course. So, as we've covered here today already, what we're talking about with the humane hoax or the humane myth is obfuscation. 
limited or misleading information surrounding use of the word humane that isn't providing us a complete picture. When it comes to labeling consumer products, for example, advertisers deliberately manipulate language to convince us that we want what it is they have to offer. Many in the profession claim that the most effective advertising doesn't tell the whole story, but offers just enough information to intrigue and attract, intentionally remaining somewhat evasive. This allows a potential customer to then subconsciously fill in the blanks with our own preferences, hopes, and desires. Now, advertisers bank on the understanding that it is not so much what they say that really counts, but as Joanne mentioned, how they receive the message, and of course, specifically, how the message makes us feel. The language of the humane hoax is effective because it feels good. It gives consumers who want to go on eating animals and are eggs and dairy relief from worry. It provides permission, reinforcement, even plants the notion that if we follow our conscience even just one day a week, then we'll be doing something we can feel good about and that maybe that might be enough. Now, obviously the word local is perfectly benign on its own. But when it comes to food, it is one of many terms used to prop up the humane myth. It's still not widely understood that our food choices make a much bigger difference than how our food has traveled, not least of all when it comes to GHG emissions. Now, other humane hoax presenters, thank you, Vaz, have covered this topic extremely well, so I don't need to go there today. But I do want to underscore that, of course, there are many reasons why local is a perfectly fine word. It's a feel-good word. It conjures up a sense of community, close at hand, of connection and embedded relationship that is trustworthy. And of course, the word locavore naturally capitalizes on this notion, encouraging folks to eat in season, to help foster food security by supporting local growers, by purchasing directly from farmers who deserve a fair wage, instead of giving our own hard-earned dollars to big box stores and multinational corporations that we know exploit workers and pollute the environment. Now, what's not to love about any of that? Now, obviously, we certainly don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's not what this is about. But we do need to scratch beneath a shiny surface veneer that pre presents locavorism in so many so-called progressive, green-leaning communities today is almost a kind of panacea to our dysfunctional global food system. Importantly, the Humane Hoax Project is about encouraging those of us with the privilege of choice to very seriously reconsider our relationship with the non-humans involved in the equation. The animal nations with whom we share this planet, but have subjugated to our own ultimate detriment, having largely ignored the role of animal agriculture in exacerbating our climate crisis and the spillover of zoonotic diseases that can also take the world by their own kind of storm. I have to admit, I was more optimistic 30 years ago, but I'm still guided by the notion that once we know better, we can do better. We can and must certainly continue to live conscientiously in place wherever we have the privilege of doing so, while understanding that reducing our ecological footprint is significantly more complicated than food miles. I've always remembered the piece of advice a colleague of mine shared at one of the ecofeminist Women in the Earth conferences I hosted in the early 90s when I was still an urban dweller. She'd asked a First Nations elder in her own community, respectfully, what is the most important thing I can do as a settler to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem? The answer she received was find a place and stay there. So this really resonated with me as a young environmentalist connected, disconnected, I should say, from my own biological roots, but fully on board with thinking globally and acting locally. I recognized Indigenous allegiance to place as embodied responsibility, because on a deeply spiritual level and a wholly pragmatic level, there is no separation between self and the rest of the biotic community in the Indigenous worldview. We must care for the ecosystems that care for us. Now this was the early 90s, and I would soon leave the city behind me permanently this time to renew my long held desire for a much closer relationship to the land. In my late teens, I'd lived briefly on a farm 
long enough to get salmonella food poisoning, actually. I was in the hospital for a week. It was no mild case. And it was likely caused by the consumption of a cracked egg. But years later, I was still dreaming about what I naively thought of as the simple country life. I imagined one day I'd be eating only my own homegrown fruits and vegetables, making cheese from the milk of a contented cow, and plucking fresh eggs from the nests of happy hens. Only inspecting each one carefully before cracking it open. But by the early 90s, I was no longer a vegetarian who only avoided eating animal bodies. I was a vegan. Working at Animal Free Trade, the first animal rights store in Canada, founded by the late Bob Korish. I had become politicized around the politics of food, in part through a slideshow on the sexual politics of meat, offered by the late Marty Keel, a co-founder of Feminists for Animal Rights. I made sure the book by that name, The Sexual Politics of Meat, authored by Carol J. Adams, had a central place in our storefront window as soon as it came out, and Carol remains a beloved mentor to this day. Ecofeminism has helped me to understand how power and privilege operate within the patriarchal paradigm dominating our planet. And that if I recognized bodily autonomy as a central tenet of my feminism, it was only morally consistent to extend that recognition to other bodies, to all bodies. I could no longer ignore the fact that animal husbandry, and there it is in the word, including the so-called production of eggs and dairy, I'd been conditioned to think of as byproducts is entirely predicated upon domination and manipulation of the female reproductive cycle. Upon the othering, objectification and commodification of the female body. And it had become clear to me that farmed animals are expected to comply with their own oppression or be forced into submission. I vowed to stop being ruled by my taste buds and the temporary gratification of familiar foods I had been misled to believe are a necessary part of a healthy diet and to strive instead to align my dietary choices with my feminist ethics. Now the desire to find my own place and stay there led me to the Gulf Islands where I would begin to practice permaculture year round. The word permaculture is a contraction of permanent agriculture or permanent culture and is all about designing ecological human habitats and food production systems. The term locavore wouldn't be invented until 2005, still a dozen years away at that point. But the back to the land movement I had been enamored with as a teen, the growing interest in farmers markets and organic food production that followed had been busy setting the stage. The very idea of small as beautiful, of smaller scale as the mere opposite of industrial scale agriculture was framed to imply a more conscientious relationship with the natural world overall. Raising animals for consumption in smaller numbers with room to graze was being touted as sustainable. Smaller scale local farming was becoming an assumed, assumed ethical alternative to big business as usual. Now, permaculture is at a foundational level very much about living a deeply localized life with the intention of reducing one's ecological footprint. Naively, I expected some flexibility in the patriarchal model I would encounter on the, the uh, permaculture farm I moved to for study and hands-on experience. But many, if not most teachers and practitioners in the field of permaculture are adamant about incorporating farmed animals. These folks say they aim for a so-called closed loop system that avoids imported fertility, for example, that they need to involve farmed animals. Veganic growers sustain, or sorry, abstain from introducing either harmful chemical fertilizers or brown manure from farmed animals, which is essentially just digested plant material that is passed through the body of an animal. We bypass any need for farmed animals in part by sowing green manures also known as cover crops, which feed the soil directly. Ideally, we minimize disruption of a pre-existing biodiversity in the landscape where our crops are planted. In fact, veganic growers aim to coexist harmoniously, even enhance indigenous flora and fauna in the ecosystem as much as possible. 
Keeping introduced animal species off the land helps to do that. I'm not going to delve into the tired old argument that it's not the cow, but the how. Other speakers of the Humane Hoax Project have certainly taken that myth on fully armed with all the data. I will simply underscore the fact here, however, that reliance on so-called livestock for soil fertility requires considerably more resources, including land, as Vaz laid out for us earlier. There is simply no natural niche for domesticated pigs, chickens, sheep, goats, cows, etc., that have evolved in entirely different ecosystems. Such animals have arrived here in Canada, at least, with the colonizers, who either destroyed and or pushed Indigenous peoples, their own land-based agricultural practices, and wildlife out of their way. Only a little over a century ago in Kinkam Inlet, for example, about 120 miles north of me here on Demon Island, Tiswatinook women were still cultivating root gardens of silverbank clover, Pacific silverweed, northern rice root, and Nootka lupin, when a settler named McKay decided to fence off the land and deny any further access. As reported in 1914 by hereditary chief Cessa Hollis to the Royal Commission on Indian Affairs for the province of BC, Pacific crab apple trees that had provided another source of food well suited for overwinter storage were cut down by settlers and additional elimination of traditional root digging grounds came about through the introduction of imported livestock. Now when permitted freedom of movement outdoors, farmed animals must be protected from predation not just for their own good, but because they are an investment. They must be kept safe from the wildlife that actually belongs on the land they occupy as captives. One bittersweet memory I have of my time on the permaculture farm in the early 90s has to do with a beautiful little hen. Sybil was actually born in an incubator with a slight deformity, never standing a chance at the bottom of the pecking order among her own kind. And so she was adopted by students at the farmhouse and we bonded as she grew. Sybil revealed her unique personality, knew her name, and would come racing up to the veranda for a treat when called. It was easy to spend far too much time with her cradled in my lap, her small head buried in the crook of my arm. A contented chicken will not only sigh, they will coo like a purring cat. But predation is the leading cause of premature bird mortality wherever real freedom to roam is granted. And one day, our sweet Sybil simply vanished. She was likely picked off by an eagle, hawk, or owl out in the open. Where I live today, other wildlife like mink and raccoons are vilified by small-scale farmers. Claiming to care for the chickens they raise, these folks certainly seem to value them more than the animals they perceive as a threat to their egg producers. Mink, for example, can find their way into a chicken coop through the tiniest crevice and kill every single bird they are able to access in a brutal frenzy. There's no doubt about that. My partner, Mike, has become quite specialized in helping folks resolve perceived problems with wildlife humanely. Although no fan of keeping chickens that aren't rescues, Mike has helped countless folks better secure small coops he does this not only to help protect the birds, but on behalf of the wildlife he knows will be trapped and killed if they manage to gain access. And believe me, no one is keeping track of those numbers. One day on the permaculture farm, I happened to notice how a number of sheep were hugging the fence line on a steep hillside. I wondered if they might have sensed a predator about because at that time, there were still wolves known to be on the island. When I mentioned this uncharacteristic behavior to the resident vegetarian, she told me that this was why she'd made plans to be off island the next day. Oh, they sense danger, all right, she said, but it has nothing to do with wolves. It's because slaughter is scheduled for tomorrow. Somehow, they always know. Now these folks conducted slaughter on the farm because they truly believed that was less stressful for the animals than subjecting them to the trauma of transport. And I definitely don't want to imply that folks who raise farmed animals don't necessarily believe they aren't doing their best for them under existing circumstances. 
a regional farmer who gained SPCA certification for his dairy products told me how distressed he was by the horrible grieving process the mother cows would go through upon separation from their calves within hours of giving birth. So he decided to try leaving them together a little longer and use calf nose rings to aid the weaning process. The plastic spikes on these things prod mama's tender udder, forcing her to reject her frustrated baby. The experiment, according to this farmer, was a disaster. He discovered that it didn't reduce the level of stress at all for anyone. He went back to stealing the calves away as soon as possible, convinced that that was the most humane way to get the job done after all. Of course, as Renee reminded us this morning, there is no truly humane way to do the wrong thing. I did learn a lot during the year and a half I spent on the permaculture farm, observing the landscape, the flow of water as it changes through the seasons, planting by the phases of the moon. But my epiphany came in the form of a lovely little book one of my permaculture teachers received hot off the press from the UK, Abundant Living in the Coming Age of the Trees, written by Kate Janaway and published in 1991. It was essentially a treatise for veganic agroecology, and it was exactly what I'd been waiting for. When I moved to Demon Island in 1993, I founded DIVA, the Demon Island Veganiculture Association. In an attempt to promote permaculture principles that don't rely on the inclusion of farmed animals in organic growing systems, the International Vegan Organic Network that would eventually link growers practicing veganic agriculture around the world was still a few more years away from its inception at that point. But things were actually starting to look somewhat promising in the 90s. In fact, I've been involved with logging blockades in Clackwood Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island here in BC, organized around eco-feminist values. A vegan kitchen was set up in the clear cut called the Black Hole that served as our base peace camp. We fed thousands of protesters from around the world who showed up that summer to support us, completely nourishing 100% plant-based meals. This is actually a little known piece of environmental history on the west coast of BC, where the mass arrests that would mark Clackwood summer 93 was the largest act of civil dis disobedience in Canadian history up until fairly recently, when the number of arrestees defending the old growth forest in Ferry Creek, also here on Vancouver Island, would surpass that record in the last few years. Now back on Demon in my new island community, I was emboldened to begin hosting monthly vegan potlucks that welcomed folks of all dietary persuasions. I mean, for one thing, the link between deforestation and animal agribusiness was already clear to some of us. With only a handful of vegans in our small rural community, however, we wanted to grow those numbers, obviously, if not change the world. Preaching to the converted wasn't going to do that. So our guest speakers and films were not limited to focusing on animal rights or even food politics. Sure, we profiled some very direct messaging, including documentaries like Earthlings and Cowspiracy when it came out, but we intentionally covered a wide range of social justice environmental issues to bring people of all orientations together and help normalize ethically motivated 100% plant-based food sharing as both pleasurable and pragmatic. But over the following years, as fully plant-based cuisine became more accepted by the mainstream, I realized that veganism had been reduced to a dietary choice and was simply being allowed a seat at the table, as long as we minded our manners and didn't really rock the boat. Vegan-friendly meat and dairy analogs were becoming more and more available in the marketplace. The pressure was on to simply be grateful for these options, to trust capitalism, and believe that things were getting better for farmed animals, even though the number of animals slaughtered for food worldwide were continuing to rise. By the mid-2000s, the concept of locavorism was definitely trending. And along with it, a growing concern about local food security and a commitment to entrench traditional farming as reflected of cultural heritage values. And by traditional in this context, of course, I mean as reflective of, of settler colonialism, settler expansionism, which imposes non-Indigenous species on the landscape. Years into our potluck series, 
I remember sitting down at a table next to folks fully engaged in a discussion about making bone broth. Our vegan communal dinners had become popular opportunities for socializing over a hearty meal. But it seemed that our inclusive approach towards consciousness raising was fostering far more comfort with flexitarianism than anything else. A local so-called sustainability festival would welcome the now institutionalized Demna Community Vegan Potluck Series to participate. Then I found out they had every intention of still serving locally grown hamburger. I called the farmer and he said, but fireweed, it's just one cow, not even. Going on to explain that the other half of this particular animal was still in his freezer. We countered that particular festival event with a veggie burger dinner of our own and an excellent presentation on the topic of food choices versus food miles. But it was clear that whatever progress we'd hoped we'd begun making years earlier had hit a wall and the backlash was now only doubling down. Femivorism was on the rise as part and parcel of the burgeoning locavore scene. John Samba Matsu, who has been a presenter in former Humane Hoax conferences, is currently working on a book about this disturbing trend. Rejecting Carol Adams' expose on the sexual politics of meat that illustrates clearly how sexism and speciesism are absolutely intertwined, femivores are equating their own liberation with a back-to-the-land approach that puts them in the dominator position as livestock farmers and butchers. John has documented how so many of these women claim to care for the animals they raise for slaughter like their own children, even though they have every intention of betraying them. In one of my women in the earth gatherings held on Demon Island, someone raising rabbits, allegedly as a source of local protein, shared how difficult it was for her to wring their poor little necks. Our visiting guest presenter, a well-known herbalist specializing in plants, but whom it turned out also raises goats, offered a chilling retort. Women must be both midwives at birth and at death, she said. After all, and I quote, if we don't do it, we're leaving it to the men and we can't have that. This attempt to assure women rather than, than uh, that death by our own gentle hands is preferable to callous murder by men, rather than no killing at all would haunt me for years to come. After all, I'd invited this person into the same space where I'd hosted dozens of vegan potlucks over the years, very deliberately centering nonviolence. Not long after, I heard that our community school was hosting a workshop on backyard chicken butchery. I can't describe how utterly deflated I felt learning that all of the attendees were women. The fact of the matter is, homesteading is romanticized by the lure of locavorism. This has been my experience as some kind of responsible philosophy. But how responsible is it and to whom? The notion that the word local equals antibiotic free, fully grass fed or raised only on organic feed is definitely a misnomer. Social media is very telling and discussions where I live around the um, animal feed, you know, indicate very little of it's locally grown. And that includes the chicken scratch. So many people feed the hens they keep for eggs, supposedly as a, a local food security measure. Organic feed is much more expensive and often cost prohibitive for folks who'd actually like to turn a profit at the farm gate or farmer's market. And unless I'm mistaken, there are no commercially available animal products grown here that are actually organically certified. Allegedly, this is because so much certification is an onerous process involving way too much paperwork for small scale farmers. And you know, you can't administer your own drugs to an ill or injured animal and claim organic status. Many people also prefer to avoid expensive trips to the vet. Now, my partner and I no longer provide farmed animal care. We only house sit now for folks with companion and or rescue animals, but we used to provide that service less discriminately. I remember one client advising me how to handle a little chicken that had been sick for a while. Don't fret over her, I was advised. She probably won't make it. I wondered what to do with her body if she passed while these folks were away. My instructions? 
just toss it on the compost. As I've experienced it, the farming of animals at any scale is always accompanied by learned callousness and selective compassion. This next photo is disturbing. And uh, I came across this truck uh, on the road one day on my way into town. It uh, pulled into a parking lot. I jumped out and photographed um, what I saw. And I'm hoping it's going to pop up on the screen any second. And if it doesn't, I may have to, here we go. Yeah, sorry about this disturbing image, folks. I actually asked these people what was going on. They had just butchered this pig and were taking it to the slaughterhouse to be, you know, carved up. It's actually illegal to transport like this. Every two or three years, a local farmer in our community brings in chicken manure from off island to turn into compost. They can sell by the yard to market gardeners and other locavores, locavore growers. There's no real allegiance here to avoiding the importation of fertility. And this manure arrives on our island by the stinking tonnage. We're talking 30 to 40 tons at a time by ferry in the back of a very large truck. The stench is so overwhelming that other passengers on the boat at the same time have been known to literally retch. And it's not just the ammonia. It's the presence of decaying bodies because inevitably injured or ill birds fall into the manure that accumulates in the facilities that house them. The following year, all traces of this unpleasantness will have been disappeared by the composting process. It's mixed with, uh, I think, a type of chip, wood chip, probably alder. Well, it's not what I'd want to put on my garden. It's growing lots of fruits and veggies here. Folks will happily purchase because, hey, they're buying local. The global biomass of poultry is now twice that of wild birds. So it's no surprise that chickens are the most numerous type of livestock on the planet, nor that they've become a kind of talisman for the locavore movement. And again, thanks to the locavore movement, there are now more farmed animals of every description on the island where I live today than there were when I moved here over three decades ago. This is not progress. And I can't think of a single species that I have not personally spent time helping herd off the road back to the farm they've escaped from. Because poor fencing is a reality and animals prefer freedom. The way some folks here handle, handle the heads up on social media when a farmed animal is spotted on the road is in my opinion, very telling about how deeply entrenched the desire is to prop up the humane myth. Rarely is concern for the safety of the animals reflected first and foremost in the comments. On the contrary, such posts are framed as a sort of amusement. Escapees at risk of being struck and killed are joked about as useful for calming traffic. The fact is humor is a powerful tool, enabling compartmentalization, which feeds our cognitive bias. Like the language used to prop up the humane hoax, humor is a distraction serving to protect or relieve us from the experience of stress. We're conditioned to not really want to know the whole story and therein avoid uncomfortable feelings. We'd really rather not think about a cow or a pig getting hit by a car. After all, if we were to take their actual vulnerability too seriously, we might be prone to thinking about the guaranteed fate that awaits most back on the farm. Not long ago, Someone posted a query on a local social media bulletin board about a series of gunshots they'd heard. They wondered what kind of hunter would be firing repeatedly like that in rapid succession. It was soon revealed that a mobile abattoir was on island, visiting a number of small scale operations. And these gunshots had come from a farm that raises pigs and goats. A few months earlier, a fair-sized Bruin was known to be roaming the island. It takes a chilly swim to reach Denman, but once in a while, a bear or a cougar takes the plunge to get here. We are living in their territory. A sighting is always bad news because the best case scenario, scenario for an apex predator is to come and go unseen rather than risk being shot by a farmer or a conservation officer. The bear was photographed feeding on the carcass of a pregnant ewe. 
conservation officers opted not to get involved because there is no end to calls about so-called problem bears. The numbers shot each year in British Columbia are shameful. And they know it's up to farmers and other members of the community to take responsibility for better coexistence. Relocation is not an option that favors wildlife. Again, there is simply no way we can talk about the humane myth and only think of how it applies to farmed animals. And Vasile showed us that as well. The simple truth is, introduced species can and do become bait for other animals who must hunt for their survival in the territories in which they have evolved. By early December, at least seven goats had also been picked off by the bear on that one homestead. The farmers told me they did everything they possibly could to deter the animal, claiming that their terrorized goats had even busted through electric fencing to try to escape attack. The bear had become so confident that he or she was no longer fleeing the scene at the sight of humans. No one has claimed to have destroyed the bear as far as I know, but everyone has been very hush-hush about it the last couple of months. The fact that there have been no more sightings reported suggests that the bear has either left the island on their own or finally met their fate the same way the remaining goats on that homestead eventually met theirs. As I wrap up here, I think it's important to remember that as long as those of us with the privilege of choice are propping up the idea that the consumption of animal products is desirable or necessary where it really is not, even if we're willing to pay more for food products we've been led to believe are more ethically produced, there will always be a cheap supply to meet demand. The bottom line is the humane myth is a prop for animal agribusiness at every scale. In my opinion, we must reject the greenwash of power holders stalling necessary change in the face of climate chaos and absolutely catastrophic biodiversity loss around the world. And it's beyond time to reject human exceptionalism. We know, metaphorically speaking, that the journey of a thousand miles does begin with a single step, but not if it's in the wrong direction. Thank you for listening. Gayla Kaslow. Thank you, Fireweed. Remind us what uh, Gayla Kaslow means. Gayla Kaslow is thank you. It, it actually means a lot of different things. Um, it's often a welcome. So it's, it's an acknowledgement. And for me, it's a, an a expression of gratitude in the language of First Nations here in my area. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fireweed. Fantastic.